Now in part two of lecture 12, we're going to spend a half hour or so gazing mostly at a simple picture of six persimmons in a row. This contradicts all the rules about how to hold an audience uh, for an illustrated lecture. The usual rule is keep the images changing, movement, striking imagery, frequent change. These are what we need. Well, and if those are the only things that will hold your attention, then you can skip over a lot of what comes next. On the other hand, if you want to hear a sincere attempt to deal with these big questions of what Chan painting really is, and even what Chan is, unanswerable questions, but still worth talking about, um, then stick with me for the next half hour or so. On the screen is the little painting of six persimmons, uh, which we'll see a lot of this uh, in this section. Uh, this used to be considered the ultimate non-analyzable, unintellectualizable painting. What can one possibly say about it? It can only, one can only sit in front of it gazing at it in silent wonder, as in, as if one were in Zen meditation. Um, I want to use it on the contrary to say quite a lot. In fact, a lot of what I now feel is most worth saying about Chinese painting can be called up by confronting directly the issues raised, as I see it, by this simple little picture. Um, and I believe that doing so will take us into just those issues that most concern me today. So, fasten your seat belts, as Betty Davis says in the movie. Anyway, here we go. Now this little picture can be uh, taken to represent at its extreme the great confrontation that I've been talking about, alluding to without really going into it very deeply. Um, between, on the one hand, the Chinese literati's bitter rejection of Mu Qi as a painter of coarse and ordinary subjects in styles that had no refinement, no brushwork, so that his paintings were fit only for hanging in monk's quarters, as they write, some of them write. And on the other hand, the reverence for this picture, the virtual worship of it by Japanese and some foreign Zen believers, those who want to mystify uh, Chan painting it as something beyond analysis. Now, I don't want to take either side. And I'll try to steer clear of both in talking about it. Some Yuan writers, to be sure, there are uh, Yuan writers who have more positive things to say about Mu Qi. There's a book on um, plum painting, Shimada, uh, studied and published, Sung Jai Meipu, which just uh, writes more positive about Mu Qi. But the effect of, uh, on Mu Qi in China and the whole judgment of him over the centuries is very much as I have described it and no less real. He's, he was sort of wiped out there as far as the genuine paintings go. Okay, now, first of all, what would happen if we tried against all the admonitions to analyze this little picture stylistically and art historically even? Well, I used to do that in my classes, in fact, just to make this point. Now, what has the artist actually done? He has lined up six persimmons, obviously, that's it, that's easy. Yes, but far more than that. He varies them in size. Uh, the stems point in different directions, as you see. Their spacing is not uh, simple after all, rather subtle. Slight overlappings sometimes. Um, much more than one notices at first, that is. And most effective is his skillful use of ink tonality, uh, dark to light. Now, um, I used to show quite a few details from late Sung paintings, 13th century generally, composite images, uh, more or less the same things lined up, to show how ink tonality was distributed within these, typically. Tree groves and things like that. Well, here's one of them. Uh, next, please. Here's, put this beside the, uh, we're going to have a series of things uh, put beside the persimmons, compare and contrast. This is a painting in the Berkeley Art Museum, belongs to my daughter Sarah now, a painting of a bamboo grove that is probably by an artist named Tanjir Rui, uh, late 13th, early 14th century uh, artist who was active in Zhejiang, known only in Japan from inscriptions and seals on paintings there, and very little known about him, completely forgotten in China. Um, the painting, by the way, is, is reproduced in my Sogenga catalog, if you want to look at it. Now the effect here is somewhat the same. 
um, that is, the artist has put, has repeated more or less similar forms, uh, more or less the same number, and put in the exact center the darkest and solid black, then one that's a little bit lighter off to the side of that, then one still uh, lighter, and then so on, going back. Um, okay, what is the, you can see that that, uh, the, the two are similar in that respect. This is, I say, typical of th 13th century things. I used to have other examples too. Now, what is the um, what is the effect of this? To it approximates optical experience. That is, concentrating the gaze on a central element of group, and the others are successively peripheral, uh, going off to the sides. This oh, this device allows the eye to take in the group as a single image. Concentration, focus, in effect, like focus. It works very effectively in both cases, I think you will agree. Um, now, uh, okay, let's go on. There's that's one aspect of it that I think is important, and an art historical, stylistic aspect of it. Now, the next, please. Here, ah, oh, this is quite, this is quite a wonderful photograph. This is obviously a photograph. Here is six persimmons, right? Uh, this came from my old. Uh, colleague, friend, younger colleague, friend, Yoshi, Yoshiaki Shimizu. Um, he and I are mm, brothers in the doctrine, so to speak, as he used to say, because we both studied the Shimada. Uh, Yoshi taught at UC Berkeley for a time, then moved to the East Coast, Freer Gallery, uh, years of teaching at Princeton, now retired and living in Oregon. And he sent me this photograph of, uh, along sort of to various people a few months ago, which he made for fun uh, when the persimmons were ripe, um, and obviously alluding to Mucci's picture. Well, it's um, um, funny but uh, and perceptive in its way, but it also shows that uh, what, 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 why you can't just line up six persimmons and have a painting like Mucci's. That is, these don't be, even begin to command our attention the way the little painting is. Why? Because they're, they're all alike, they're all lined up in a row, there's no focus, no unifying into a real composition, no difference in tonality and so forth. Well, he didn't expect that. I'm not criticizing it, I'm saying he makes this point. But it's useful for making that point. Okay, going on. Here's another comparable thing, and uh, equally sort of pointless, really. Uh, this is from a hand scroll I'll talk about later. A hand scroll of copies, probably, almost certainly copies after a work by Mucci. Um, and these copyists here, uh, well, he, he makes them all uniform, first of all. And then he makes uh, 11 of them, uh, thinking, well, if 6 is good, then 11 is better. Or maybe the original had 11 persimmons, I don't know. At any rate, it doesn't work. It's dull, repetitive, and so on. But um, that, putting these two together, I should make the point, you know, there are fairy tales in which the, in which the dull brother ends up entering the palace at the end, marrying the princess. Well, the, this is something like that. What if this painting were to end up entering the emperor's palace, as in fact is what happens? And we need, we need to put the persimmons in a wider context to understand just how this happened. Okay, here we go. Now, beside the persimmons, now I put a small painting of chestnuts. Uh, both of them are in one of the Daitokuji Zen temples, uh, the, one of the sub-temples called the Juko-en. Very famous there, revered, in fact, as Zen paintings. I don't have a good slide of the chestnuts. This is from an old photograph, old slide. You can see that it has something in common. You can still see that the middle uh, right leaf is the darkest and the other somewhat lighter, um, as you can see. Well, as I say, I won't talk about that because I don't have a good slide. I'll show others. Um, but th both of them were very probably, we now believe, cut from a hand scroll, like the ones that were, like the ones that were copied in the two copies, uh, but cut in Japan from hand scrolls uh, for tea ceremony use, hanging in the tokonoma for gazing at. The Japanese, they used hand scrolls, of course, the great emaki for, uh, for um, narrative and so on. But they were not very happy with hand scrolls that you simply looked at to appreciate. So they would cut them up and mount them. Now, here, to make that point further, here are two more, uh, next please, side by side. 
a leap to leap. Uh, let's skip the persimmon just for a moment. Um, these two representing, as you see, cabbage and a kind of radish or turnip, anyway, uh, vegetables. Muchi is known to have painted pictures of this kind. It's one of the things that the uh, the uh, writers on Muchi say about him. Uh, they list the subjects he did, and among them are vegetables, sort of low-life, commonplace subjects. Um, well, okay, uh, these, do these come from a hand scroll? Well, immediately when you well, ask a question like that, you look to see if there are breaks or folds or whatever on the silk, on the, in this case, paper. A little bit different, but still. Uh, actually, as far as I can see, and I don't remember seeing the originals, I made one of once, um, there's only a kind of fold mark in this very center, vertical. That means they may originally have been album leaves. It's quite possible that Mucci would have done albums of this kind with pictures as well as, uh, as, well as hand scrolls. You can see clearly here that someone, the mounter, has put paper, added paper up above. Everything above a certain point in each picture is new paper. Whether the writing on them is Mucci's writing or somebody else, people who are good in calligraphy will have to uh, have an opinion on comparing them with other writing by Mucci on his bigger paintings, which, which we've seen. Anyway, I'm not, I'm not taking a stand on that. I had myself dismissed these two as not by Mucci in my old index, but now I'm more inclined to see them as maybe uh, taken from a real Mucci hand scroll or album. Um, okay, now going on again. Here, uh, I, I, I'll put, let's put these beside or under them, underneath, let's say two long sections of one of the two hand scrolls I spoke about. These are hand scrolls um, uh, probably copied after Mucci's works, made up of paintings of vegetables, plants, birds, and so on, miscellaneous subjects. They're in Chinese collections, one of them in the Palace Museum in Taipei, and the other in the Palace Museum in Beijing. So, uh, I have an article uh, titled, Continuations of Chan Painting into Ming Qing and the prevalence of type images. And it's, uh, it's in the Archives of Asian Art, number 5050, 1997-98. Uh, so if you want to read it, it's there. And these, uh, one of these paintings, uh, copies, is, is reproduced and discussed in it. They, the copies are probably from the Yuan Dynasty, maybe early Ming, 14th century, let's say. Um, we don't know who did them. Uh, and... This, what I'm showing, is from the Taipei scroll. I don't have good slides of the Beijing one. The Beijing scroll has a colophon by the important Ming artist Shun Zhou, Shun Zhou, famous artist, who copied parts of it, and I reproduced parts of his copies in my article. Um, Shun Zhou seems to have admired it, and in fact other uh, famous painters of the Ming did also and copied parts of it. Chun Shun, or Chun Daofu, Xu Wei, great master, uh, all these uh, reproduced and talked about in my article. And it ends with, um, well, let me speak about that in just a minute. Uh, the next, let's see. Yes, here's a, here's a um, slide. Here's the entire scroll uh, reproduced together. This is the Taipei scroll, as I say. It begins up at the top with a flower, which we'll see in a bit, um, rose mallow, some call it. And then a whole series of flowers, persimmons, the... Uh, uh, something like Asian pears at the far left of the first stop, then down below persimmon, uh, the uh, persimmons, and vegetables, 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 and so forth, uh, green onions, and at the left of the, next to the bottom, two birds, shrikes, uh, uh, on a mound of land. These, I say, are all copies, and then it ends with, uh, well, a bird in flight and a larger thing of land with more birds on it, pheasants. Okay, and then the signature of Muchi at the, uh, at the end, copied. Uh, okay, next please. Here's the shrike, one of them from that scroll, a detail. Uh, and beside it, I'll put a painting attributed to Muchi, famous one. Uh, I don't have a good slide of it. This is made from a reproduction in Seren's book. Uh, this is Seren 3. Uh, volume 3, page uh, number three, uh, 343. At any rate, this painting uh, is quite famous in Japan and owned 
maybe still is, I owned when I first saw it by the dealer Setsu in Tokyo. Uh, this has a Muchi seal on it. It may really be his work. And um, the, this 17th century individualist master, Bada Shanran, or Juda, uh, did paintings quite similar to this, uh, which indicates that somehow this design was transmitted to him. In paintings, I was arguing, may be transmitted in Buddhist monasteries. It could be that real Muchis were transmitted in China in the Buddhist temples or monasteries. We don't know much about their collections, and in any case, most of them didn't survive into modern times. Cultural Revolution, among other things, finished off some of them. Um, okay, at any rate, for the account of how all of this happened, and how these paintings were received and copied by Ming artists, see my article in Archives, uh, Archives of Asian Art, uh, for 1997-98, uh, uh, which ends, as I say, by showing how the great individualist master uh, Bada Shanran uh, received them. And he himself was an artist who broke the rules and made new and exciting imagery out of them. That's the point that I end with. That's another story, however. Well, at any rate, um, the people who, mostly in China, the artists who were doing these, uh, copying these, couldn't, could not see genuine Muchi paintings without traveling to Japan because none of them were, were they were not surviving in accessible collections in China, say, uh, possibly still to be seen in Chan monasteries. I, I don't know the answer to that. Now, anyway, this is what happened to Muchi. He was cleaned up, transformed into neat brushwork, into uh, expressions of, of, uh, of expressively mild forms, now let's go on. Here's a, uh, a painting of the uh, flowers, some variously called hibiscus and rose mallow. Um, these are from the Taipei Scroll again. Well, the um, copy on the left and the original, uh, also in Japan, may be cut from an original Muchi hand scroll on the right. Um, well, uh, the copy, as you see, is all done in... Uh, in uh, orthodox and quite controlled uh, brushwork, brush strokes, and um, or with orthodox limits on ink tonality, um, and it doesn't have the kind of rough brush stuff that the other does. The What, what seems to me the real one follows uh, the kind of uh, what form that I've talked about of having a dark, you see the dark leaf in the center and lighter leaves going out, and you see scratchy uh, nasty brushwork here and there, and you see a lot of puddling, interesting puddling, and all kinds of interesting, uh, not brushwork, because there isn't any brushwork really, but ways of putting ink on paper to represent and uh, this and make it an exciting image out of this out of this flower. Well, okay, the, what you see on the left then is what was done to Muchi. He was cleaned up. He was transformed into neat brushwork into sets of expressively mild forms that one could roll past and not be confronted by uh, as the Japanese viewer is confronted by the persimmons and the others in the, in the tea ceremony hanging scrolls as they've been made. The persimmons, that is, sort of gaze out at us almost as insistently as Muchi's mother Gibbon gazes out at us, uh, uh, almost as insistently. Uh, in other words, um, Muchi was preserved in China by being robbed of everything that gave his images their power, his teeth pulled, so to speak. And through that, he was able to move from the despised monk's hut, where he was originally consigned, to the imperial palace, like at the end of the fairy tale, as I said. Uh, these two hand scrolls went through distinguished collections, and as you can see at the right of the, of the uh, copy of the uh, copy here, um, Imperial seals, but also seals of Shang and Bian, great 16th century collector. Dong Chi Chang served in his household uh, for a time and saw his collection and so on. Um, so and then these these went uh, these two went into the palace, much appreciated, much copied, while the real Mu Chi, banished from China, survives only in Japan. Okay, there's my, I've made my point. Now back to the uh, persimmons. And I'll let me elaborate more uh, no, while you just gaze at them. If I make you gaze at them for half an hour, that's good. <laughs> I hope. 
uh, patients. And so I can elaborate further on the implications of this matter and consider for a moment what we mean or what we think we mean by talking about Chan painting. What I've shown up to now in paintings by Muchi and other Chan related artists have mostly uh, been think relatable to the Chan sect by subject. Chan masters, Chan Im uh, images of Chan adherents and, and uh, the um, uh, Guanyin and so forth. Um, not this. This is no way uh, this can be said, called a Chan subject. And I used to ask uh, to my students when I brought up this kind of matter, in what ways can we relate a system of philosophy or a religious sect to a body of paintings? And I would go through them, moving from the simplest to the most direct. Uh, and, uh, well, they include, for instance, starting from the most direct, paintings can represent events in the history of that sect or people who are involved in it. That's the easy way. That's, that's uh, for straightforward. Paintings can have been used in rituals or otherwise within the sect, like Buddhist icons. That's fairly straightforward. Paintings can be documented as having been done by masters of that sect. Which number of them are that? They can bear inscriptions indicating how they were owned and appreciated by adherents of that sect. Now all these are relatively straightforward, but what if we go beyond these? There are paintings in Japan that are considered Zen paintings, and people will be shocked if you question that. And yet they don't belong to any of these categories. What about them? What if the Muchi authorship of the persimmons were removed from the little picture? Would that rob it of, would that uh, take away its status as a Zen painting? Well, the answer, I hope, is no. And yet to question its status as a Zen painting would be almost sacrilegi sacrilegious. In what sense, then, is it Zen? Please understand that what I'm talking about here are art historical interpretations, not historical facts. It's easy to make counter-arguments if one wants to, and probably people will. Okay, they won't invalidate what I'm saying, because I say these are formulations, they're arguments, they're something else. Okay, here we go again. Now, this is a, an image that certainly has qualities of the enigmatic, even the profound, and yet it depicts something that is ordinary, mundane, persimmons. Uh, the simplification, first of all, which makes for immediacy, uh, the formal means that I showed, uh, ink tonality and spacing and so on, that allow, that unite the persimmons into a single image I showed. The effect of this is that the image registers immediately on the mind of the viewer. There's no intermediate process of analysis and synthesis. Also, there's no reference to anything else in style and brushwork or whatever. There's no multi-level response. You know, like here is a rock, here is a Li Tong rock, here is a rock done in this, this kind of distinctive brushwork, and so on. The persimmons has none of these. It has no style. In that sense, it's sort of like what Lur said in praise of the little landscape by Xia Gui, which I showed in the previous lecture as the highest praise one could have for a painting. I'm absolutely with him on that. Now, I want to mention a, um, an article, long forgotten, uh, important in its way, I think, by a uh, scholar, Chinese painting and philosophy scholar, named Victoria Kontag, German. She was in China during the 1940s. She wrote a famous seal book, on book on collector's seals, along with C.C. Wong. Anyway, she was famous for her writings, but she was a very uh, mysterious and difficult woman. Her writing is extremely difficult. She never made it in academia because she couldn't give lectures that anybody could understand, really. Anyway, she wrote an article. Uh, the title translated is The Unique Characteristics of Chinese Landscape Painting. And it appeared in the archives of Chinese art, as it was then, later Asian art, archives number six, 1951. It was translated with great difficulty by Larry Sickman. He told me once that it took him a week to do it and a lot of work. Um, her, her, her German was very difficult indeed, and the, the, the article itself was pretty difficult. At any rate, if you're seriously interested, find it and read it. Archives number six for 1951. Now, from memory, I haven't seen it and read it for decades, but just from memory, Victoria Kontag, in this article, makes a parallel between 
the Confucian theory of knowledge, by which the bewildering diversity of real, visual, and other sensory experience of the world uh, needs to be organized, reduced to a system in order to be manageable, since the human mind can make sense of the world only by recognizing recurring patterns and forms and relating the raw materials of perception to this, and, on the other hand, the formulation of literati painting styles, which does something comparable for landscape painting. That is, it sets up a system of brushwork, of forms, of compositions, that makes it controlled and orderly. And the outcome of that process is best exemplified in the orthodox school of landscape that follows Dung Chi Chong in the 16th into the 17th century. That is, the landscape subject, the image, the picture, becomes unimportant, it's repetitive. Nobody cares, nobody you know, is very interested in the picture. One can't really appreciate them as pictures. Xi Xi Wang used to tell me this over and over and show me. And yet the appreciation of these orthodox school landscapes was the very basis of connoisseurship in modern China, the circle of Wu Hu Fan from which Xi Xi Wang and Xu Bang Da came. They studied how to appreciate and value and distinguish genuine from fake and so forth in orthodox school landscape. And in fact, Wu Hu Fan and Xi Xi Wang in his early work are kind of continue that tradition. Well, as I hardly need to say, this is not the kind of connoisseurship that was acceptable to me. I learned it uh, up to a point, not, never as far as C.C. Wong, of course. But in my Lyric Journey book, for instance, I compared the, uh, the repetitive orthodox school landscapes of this kind to Japanese um, tea scoops, the little bamboo sticks that you scoop up the tea with in the tea ceremony, because they are very similar. They can hardly be told apart by the am amateur, the outsider. And yet, uh, the connoisseurship of them is supposed to be uh, very esoteric and very high level. And my argument was the fact they were harder to appreciate doesn't mean that they represent a higher taste. Okay, anyway, that, that's my belief. In this Confucian approach to knowledge, as is defined by Kontag, uh, visual phenomena pass through a kind of organizing and categorizing process, like data through a machine, and are given an intellectual overlay. The image in painting can be correspondingly overlaid with symbolism, can be made to evoke echoes of poetry or history or whatever it may be in the mind of the viewer. The artist, that is, necessarily does this by providing cues, including elements of style and imagery that refer to something already there in the viewer's mind and call up these references. The complexity of painting earlier in the song, literati painting especially, um, painting by, by uh, some of the artists such as Zhao, Zhao Lingrong and Huo Wang Shun. Admiration for brushwork, admiration for old styles, for execution, the symbolism of the subject, uh, personal styles, all of that, the use of conventional images, poetic references. All of these were interposed between the image and the viewer in a sense, or can be regarded that way, or imposed on the subject, if you think of it that way. Even the poetic quality of a lot of Southern Song court painting means that the subject was used for a kind of literary artistic purpose. The artist, that is, not only presents the image, but tries to determine or at least structure your response to it. At worst, he tells you what you should feel about the subject. Well, in other words, this is a fine painting because it falls, it follows all the rules and it, uh, it, it, the rules that we agreed on, or we have collectively agreed on, and that eventually leads to dullness in the Orthodox school in the later part. The Orthodox school starts out exciting and fine with Dong Chi Chang and especially Wang Yuan Chi, and then it trails off into a repetitive, oh, but same thing over and over. Okay. Now, in any case, seeing this way, the way uh, the Confucian theory of knowledge and so on is defined by Kontag, is completely antipathetic to Zen, which does not confront the mind with formalized experience, quite the opposite. Zen apprehension of the world is not a matter of uh, confrontation of a viewer versus a viewed, with a barrier of intellect and, and uh, thinking about it in between. In Zen, in theory, and I say this, I, I, I'm not exactly a 
uh, I, I, I don't think I ever achieved Satori, so I don't claim it. I'm, I'm, this is my understanding. In Zen, the viewer and the viewed are parts of a continuum or a field in which individualization in the sense of a separate entity opposing itself to the rest of the world doesn't exist. Somehow you've gone beyond that, outside that. Chan artists similarly try to cut through all this overlay of styles, literary references, all the rest of it, and to present direct, unmediated perception of the object uh, without the intrusion of the artist or the style and so on. When writers on Zen speak about Zen artists identifying with their subjects, this is what they're getting at, I suppose. And have we achieved that in some kind of, I hope, uh, move towards Zen enlightenment by gazing at this little picture for all this long time? Well, doing this, needless to say, made Chan or Zen painting quite unacceptable to most Confucian literati critics who scorned it and talked about vulgar subjects and coarse execution and all the rest of it, and collectively saw to it that it wasn't preserved, except to our great good fortune in Japan. I started out saying that following up all the different ways of discussing the six persimmons could lead to the biggest issues that I'm confronting now, or that are confronting me, in this late period of my life. And I'll venture further into that dangerous big area after looking at some landscapes described to Mu Chi and another Chan master, Yu Jin, uh, which represent the proper end to this series as a treatment of great early history of Chinese painting, especially landscape, since they represent the final triumph of ink monochrome landscape in the Song Dynasty.